and you, I do give him credit for that, but I don't think it was done the right way. And it ended up with a, we ended up having a lot of hostility, people really struggling um, here in Guyana, foreign do, exchange issues and so on. Do you see some of that um, evidence of being resourceful in the way you approach biodiversity today? I, I, I think um, I, <laughs> it's very difficult to talk about. Uh, we have to be. Um, First of all, if we want to talk about biodiversity, you know, Guyana is immensely wealthy in natural resources. If you want to talk just about plants, we have over 8,000 species of plants in Guyana. I, I actually um, have studied more plants than I have studied animals. The only animal I ever studied was the agouti, and I was, I was, which is a large rodent, and that was really linked to how, you, how they were using the plants, because these animals are important see disperses but but yes you you the, the bi biodiversity is is I don't know how we could explain it there there's so much we have so much here and we have to ensure that we I don't really like to use the word preserve but we, we have to ensure that we maintain and conserve it in the best possible way and when you talk about being creative and so on, it doesn't um, exclude use. I, where I work, which is Ewokrama, International Center for Rainforest Conservation and Development, we also believe in sustainable use mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, we, we, we do need to live and we do need to live off of the resources. And it, re it, it really does require um, good thinking and, and wise thinking in order to use our resources in a wise way that we, we en ensure that it's maintained and kept for your your grandchildren my great grandchildren you know the people that live there their children have to benefit as well the indigenous people that live in the interior as well so we have to keep that in mind i don't know if that answers your question yes i mean it it it, it speaks to resourcefulness because you, you you know you mentioned that perhaps that's what we were being taught how to be resourceful and, and I, I know that with, the, um, with limited resources, it is very important for us to be, to be resourceful in any field of endeavor. Yeah, so and yes, you know you what? I, I, if I can add to that, mm -hmm. um, my PhD experience, I must, and I, will, I give credit to all the persons who helped me, all my friends that helped me through this, my supervisors and so on as well. But I give credit to that experience because what a PhD teaches is not about getting the doctor. Because, you know, I, as I tell people, you know, my name is Raquel. It's not about this doctor thing. It's about what you learn along the way. And what my PhD taught me was discipline, how to work in teams, how to interact with people, and how to think analytically and how to write academically. Why is this? So those are the lessons that I got. And it also taught me to be humble because... What a PhD actually tells you is you really don't know anything. There's so much to study that what you study is just like a drop. And when you do ecology, <laughs> you can only make assumptions that this is causing this and this is causing that. You know, science, there's a lot of hypotheses and you try to prove hypotheses. And, you know, people can disprove you as well. What, during, you your, during your... Um foray in the in the forests of Guyana studying whatever what was one what was one of the most humbling experiences you've had during one of these studies I, I, I think I think the people that I worked with I um, of course you're surrounded by nature that's humbling in itself just mm -hmm. the expanse and the, uh, the um, uh, and it's just so there's so much I, I People call me an expert in plants, but I'm not. There are 8,000 species. And there, there are many people that I work with that don't have a PhD. A lot of the indigenous people, the, the person that taught me about plants just died last year. Um, I have a, uh, Uncle Sam, I used to call him Uncle Sam Roberts, an Arawak man. And they had an immense knowledge of the, of the plants and the flora and the fauna and how forestry works and so on. So I think that was my first introduction to really acknowledging um, what we call now as Ewokrama and elsewhere traditional knowledge mm -hmm. and really respecting it. 
and not only respecting it as just traditional knowledge, but respecting it on par with scientific knowledge. What are some? Uh, sorry, yeah. sorry. You, friend, you go ahead. Okay. What are some plants that? Because I mean, I grew up in Guyana, and I've heard about uh, a lot about the, the many plants we have and their medicinal purposes and so on. But what are some plants that you have learned from this guy, Uncle Sammy? Um, that I learned many, many. I learned that has really um, fascinated you. Well, I'll tell you about Guyana's forest. Mm -hmm. Guyana's forest is not, when you look at a forest, it's not just one forest. It's not all the same. And even when you fly over it, it doesn't look the same. And, and for people who have flown over Guyana or intend to fly, they should observe. Guyana's forest is what we call heterogeneous. So there are different forest types. If you go for a walk, you might be walking in, in on a white on, on what we call a wall of a forest on white sands, and then you walk a bit further down, you get to a creek, you get get into what they call swamp forest, and you see a lot of palms. You walk up the hill, and you get to a soil they call laterite, and then you see what they call their uh, maybe green heart, another species they call Sarabeba Valley. I'm just Wamara. These are some of the local names that that, that I would have learned. Um, from my indigenous um, teachers and and what you find is that certain species dominate in certain forest types and they're linked to the types of soil that they grow on so it's not just one bush or one forest it's it's a multitude and there are layers there's the canopy layer there's the the, the highest layer which is called the emergent layer which trees like um, purple heart for example grows higher than green heart that's how it how it grows and and i teach this stuff and that's why i love i really love um teaching about plants because there's so many different there's so many different species mm -hmm. and there's so much to talk about plants because you could talk about how animals use plants how animals and plants interact how people use plants, how cultures use plants, which plants are poisonous, which plants are aphrodisiacs. Like right, here's that. a question. Here's a question. Fee. I'm glad you brought that up. You spend a lot of time among the indigenous people, right? Yes, I've learned a lot. You learn a lot. With students, even give us from an my example. students. Give, an, give us an example of uh, um, an interaction with a gr one of those group and a particular plant or some plants. Just tell us a story. Okay, um, there's a particular vine <laughs> called the Capadula vine. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and what they showed me, <laughs> well, I've, I've, they've showed me how to use it in many ways, actually. The first way I learned to use it is that they made a porridge with the bark. And it makes a really tasty porridge. Well, I've, I think everybody would know who knows about the forest in Guyana, that Capadula is known as an aphrodisiac, the forest in Guyana that Capadula is known as an aphrodisiac. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, that's how people know it. And some people say they got the male and the female and you have to know how to use it and so on. But anyway, but the second most important, I think this is even more important. And this is what my, my dear colleagues taught me, my indigenous colleagues. If you're ever lost in the forest and you need water, the Capadula tree, the Capadula vine, sorry, it's a vine, can save your life if you're not next to a creek. What they do is that they cut the top of the, they cut a piece, right? They cut the top and then they cut the bottom and then you drain the water into your mouth and it can save your life literally that way. Wow. So that is something I, I have, I learned from my indigenous colleagues, but that is just even the tip of the iceberg. I've learned a lot. I've learned you can use green heart seed, the green heart seed if you grate it. I don't know the dosage, so please don't go and try this at home. You can use it as birth control. The women use it as birth control. Green heart seed? Green heart seed, yes. And the green heart is a very precious wood for Guyana. It's only found in Guyana, and it's used for construction. It's a very common and popular wood for construction. We export it a lot for marine conditions and so on. So, yeah, that, that, I was surprised by that. So that was something that, that um, I... I but, I have never personally tried it, so I can't tell you. That <laughs> what, what, are, what are some of your major concerns about the environment? Well, I want, some of the major concerns for me, and I don't want to sound too cliche, but, but the whole issue relating to how we use our forests, I think is very important. Guyana has, 
good regulations in terms of um, sustainable um, forest management, the Guyana Forestry Commission, very good guidelines. Um, the mining sector has some guidelines, but I think we can improve how we do our mining. Uh, our mining. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot, there's, there's the pollution awareness and, uh, and, and so on that we need to be more conscious of. Also, um, I think by 2020, we're supposed to go mercury free. And I noticed in the newspapers the other day that the miners were not tapping into a, a, a billion dollar fund, that they can actually get help to help them to convert to going um, mercury free. And I, I would like to encourage all my mining friends, colleagues and so on to really get, get this important information. So I do have some concerns about mining as well. Mm -hmm. um, how, and, and, and also to ensure how we utilize our forest resources um, believe we should high grade the forest. I do believe um, the extraction of a particular species currently needs to be looked at. That's the Womara species that is being exported at a high level to the um, to China. And what I what I what they have discussed and I've been to a few uh, a meeting where they were presenting their work is that they were going to build they are going to build a state of the art wood processing facility here and I'm looking forward to that so that these logs don't have to go to China, but they're processed here and our people get trained on the ground here. Mm -hmm. So those are some of my, my concerns. How would wildlife? How, mm -hmm. Can I go to wildlife? Sure, or you want of to course. No, no, go ahead. go ahead. Wildlife. How, wildlife are extremely important for maintaining our forests. So agouti, agoutis, labas, bush cows, and these are the, um, the local names I'm using even our top predators, the pumas, the jaguars, and, and, and so on. We have to be careful how we hunt. We cannot just go and kill and slaughter every single laba we see in sight. We can't kill every agouti we see in sight. We shouldn't even be killing our cats because our cats are endangered and they're protected. It's illegal to do so. But I have been hearing and I've seen photos on Facebook of Guyanese who have been slaughtering pumas and jaguars. And it's, 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 it's a sin because if those animals disappear, what will happen as well as that? It's illegal, first of all. And if those top, what we call top predators disappear, is that you'll have an explosion of the other animals, then eventually your plants will suffer because they will eat out all the plants and your forest will disappear. It, it may sound very simplistic, I'm explaining it very simplistically, but it's real. I mean, agoutis, plants depend on agoutis for dispersal and regeneration, for example. So that is just one very simple way of putting it. So I really would like to really reach out to our fellow Guyanese to, if you're going hunting, I'm not saying stop hunting, but you see two lava, leave one, you know. If you see um, four poies, take one, leave the rest. I mean. And also, indigenous people depend on these animals in the interior for their, for their, for their sustenance. They use this is their form of protein. So you don't go in and kill everything because you have a restaurant in Georgetown or on the coast to provide meat for it. It, it, it's actually, it actually shows a lack of compassion for not only your environment but also for your fellow man that are living in those areas as well. So I think we need to have a conversation about this. I I I <laughs> I so t totally agree with you. It it, rem it underscores what you were saying earlier about compassion. How important compassion is Absolutely. in loving nature and so on. And Absolutely, I, it also links to people. I I want to I want to go back to that um, statement you made earlier about a mil billion dollars. Is this a billion Guyana dollars? And and how is it? Funded? I saw it in the papers. It, it, I saw it in the papers the other day, and the I think the GGMC, the Guyana um, Geology and Mines, were concerned that. Miners were not tapping into this billion dollar fund. It would be Guyanese dollars because a billion U.S. dollars would be, would be <laughs> enormous. That's what I thought, of course. It's, yeah, so sorry, I, I, I forgot I'm talking to an international crowd as well. But it's still a billion dollars is still significant. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think we have to start thinking out of the box and not, not keep doing things the way they were. Because when 2020 comes and we have to stop using mercury... What you'll have is a lot of people saying, oh, gosh, but we're not prepared. That's why you need to think ahead and have a vision 
for preparing. You have uh, 2020 is how many years away? It's not that far away. I think it's 2020 that we signed on to that. We have to eliminate the use of mercury. Mercury is very dangerous as well for the mm -hmm. ecosystem and for people as well. If I may go to the chat room, G said, we have been hearing horror stories about deforestation in Guyana. Is that a big problem? Are there efforts at reforestation? Well, I will have to explain first how um, forestry works. The only deforestation that you would have happening is due to mining and clearing for settlement and agriculture. Forestry, that's cut the timber, the timber harvesting, the type we do in Guyana, does not cause clear felling and mass de deforestation. What it causes is something we call degradation. But the kind of forestry we do in Guyana, and I want to really be balanced and be fair to the Guyana Forestry Commission, and I want to really be balanced and be fair to the Guyana Forestry Commission as well. The kind of guidelines, and we do harvest trees at Ewokrama as well, it's a protected area. The kind of forestry we do in Guyana just allows us to take approximately 10 trees per hectare and that does not cause severe damage. What you don't want to do is take all of one species, and that's against regulations. So you can't go in and the 10 species you're taking is all green heart or all wamara. You have to do a mixed species. Because what you will be doing there is taking out all the, all the genetic stocks that are going to produce good young trees in the future. So that's the reason for that. So. I don't think she needs to be so worried in terms of deforestation or deforestation levels are low, but we do have to manage better how we're doing our mining and also ensure that we do our forestry in a wise way. So do we, so we don't have what we call high grade, the forest. And when you say high grade, we're talking about taking, all, taking out one or two species rather than focusing on a multiple, uh, multiple use or a multiple um, number of species. Is there, is there appropriate, as far as you know, appropriate monitoring of the, um, the extraction of, of the various in, species? In, yeah. Yes. In terms of forestry, yeah. forestry is very strong. They have very, very strong monitoring um, in terms of what they have. They have like over, I don't know how many now, but when, I used to work at the Guyana Forestry Commission as well in the research and planning division. And when I left, they had over 20 forest stations all around the country. And their position in, at, at areas where people have to declare their lumber and, and logs and so on. Um, so the monitoring unit has also been um, strengthened over the past few years because uh, I don't know if you're aware of a strategy known as the low carbon development strategy. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of initiatives um, that came out of that It also demanded that we um, improve their monitoring as well. So I know that the, the forest, Guyana Forestry Commission does have a solid monitoring um, unit or division as they call it. And when, uh, certainly when they were crama, when we we're doing our logging, they come and visit us regularly to ensure that we're doing the right things. And they have, they do have a checklist uh, to which they would check off to see because you have to, they would check off to see because you have to be, you're supposed to be building it. They, they, they also have a, what we call a code of practice by which we function by, a code of practice for timber harvesting. So guidelines, how you build your roads, how you cut your trees, sizes of trees. You can't cut trees on a certain size, for example. All of those things are included in that. And they check for those things as well. We also have a log tracking system. And when you cut a log, you have to put a, you have to, you have a tag, you break it in half. It has a special number. You put it on the log and then you also put one on the stump. So they can always trace back the wood that you're, and even when you cut the wood up, you have to continue putting that wood, that number on it. They must always be able to take that wood back to the stump where it was, um, wow. where it was cut. So yeah. we have systems in place and I, I do encourage people to find out more and be informed before getting very emotional um, about issues. There are things that we need to work on and I think as I said we do need to work on our mining and we do need to work on our log export policy and how and we have to be very careful in terms of how we if we're high grading our forests. That's what I would have a concern because I'm concerned I'm seeing 
too many Wamara species along along the roads. Wama, that's a specific species that's in demand. Uh, as you... I would like to see them being utilized here in terms of processing. Uh, I, uh, before I go back to a biodiversity question, I want to ask you a question about mm -hmm. dwelling and working among the, alongside the indigenous people. What are some of your concerns about the, um, the conditions and uh, about the, of the indigenous people you work with? I think you need to bring some of the indigenous experts here to, <laughs> to okay. discuss. Right. But, um, no, 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 no. But, but I, 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 I just want to say that certainly from compared to a few years ago, there, there, there are more opportunities. There's more communication within communities now. Many communities have access to Internet. I have many of my friends from the interior on Facebook and social media and Blackberries and, and so on. So the, the, the technology is getting is getting into the communities and it's a good thing that's what they want we shouldn't try to dictate how indigenous people should live that let me just make that clearly because i think sometimes i think um people from the coast and western the western point of view can be very patronizing and say oh they're not traditional enough and they should stay that way and so on indigenous people have to dictate where they're going one concern that i observed that that an elder was telling me the other day that was there and he had to go and clear the river and he needed some youth men, as we say it, some young people to go and help him clear the river. And he said, I don't know what's, up, what's wrong with these young people. None of them want to come and help me do this task. So like any other young generation, you, we complain about our children. Um, you, hear, you hear it all the time, even in New York, all these young people, this and young people, that. It's the same for indigenous communities. I wanna... And one of the approaches that I know some communities are using, especially to ensure that the kids um, learn their culture, the language, the dances, and the, the jewelry making, the craft making, and so on, is to form what they call culture groups within the communities. And that's been doing a great job in terms of attracting young people. And Iwakrama and our partners, our to the, the leaders of all the villages and so on, we also work life clubs. So the children not only learn about wildlife and birds and trees, but they also we also encourage them to learn about their culture and also learn about themselves, how to take care of themselves, healthy lifestyles. And if you, yeah, because if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of the environment. So we teach them public speaking, a lot of things. Those, those kinds of things. I want to I wanna go to the chat room and then take a quick break. So, um, Sonia said, good evening to you, Selwyn, and your beautiful guest, Raquel. Proud of you both. Patrick, good evening, Selwyn, to you and your guest, Maya. Mining causes de deforestation. Are those forests not of concern? Is the Forestry Commission's monitoring work double-checked by any non-governmental body? <laughs> 